The microstructure of a steel has a particular influence on its properties. However, the steel microstructure is not only influenced by the solidification conditions. The microstructure of a steel can also be negatively influenced by subsequent manufacturing processes such as rolling, deep drawing, and welding. For these reasons, heat treatment processes have been developed in which the microstructure of the steel can be subsequently modified in a desired way by heating and controlled cooling. In this way, not only can undesirable microstructural changes that occur in many manufacturing processes be reversed, but in some cases completely new properties can be achieved. The most important heat treatment processes for steels are described in more detail in this video. These are also referred to as annealing processes. A fine microstructure with many small grains generally gives very good toughness and strength values. It is therefore desirable to have a homogeneous microstructure with small grains of the same size throughout. This is the only way to ensure that the material meets the strength requirements to the same extent at every point. However, achieving a homogeneous microstructure as the steel solidifies is challenging because the solidification conditions are not the same throughout the melt. For example, cast steel cools faster at the contact points with a mold wall than in the interior. So while a finer grained microstructure is formed at the edges due to the greater supercooling, larger grains can form in the interior of the steel. A heterogeneous microstructure can occur not only during solidification but also, for example, during forging, because at high temperatures the grain boundaries shift due to diffusion processes and the grains can fuse together. This results in the formation of new grains, leading to the formation of both small and large grains, resulting in a heterogeneous structure. The same phenomenon can also occur in welded components in the heat-affected zone. It is therefore necessary to homogenize an inhomogeneous microstructure by means of a specific heat treatment. This gives the steel its normal properties, which can be reproduced at any time. The targeted homogenization of a steel microstructure is therefore also called normalizing. In normalizing, the steel is heated to just above the GSK line so that the perlite is completely transformed into austenite. The austenitized steel is then slowly cooled in air. Since the grains are newly formed during the gamma-alpha transformation, grain refinement occurs, which gives the steel a homogeneous microstructure. The temperature for normalizing should not be more than about 30 degrees Celsius above the GSK line, otherwise there is a risk of coarse grain formation. The reason for this is that large round grains are energetically more favorable than many small ones. Therefore, the microstructure always strives for the formation of a single large grain. This requires diffusion processes, which are favored by higher temperatures. Therefore, the temperature should be kept as low as possible in order to avoid the formation of coarse grains. For this reason, hyperutectoid steels are not heated completely into the austenite range. So note, the aim of normalizing is to achieve a uniform homogeneous microstructure with reproducible properties and good strength and toughness values at the same time. Normalizing is preferably used for hypoeutectoid steels whose microstructure has been negatively influenced by manufacturing processes such as forging, rolling, casting, or welding. In rolling, normalizing can already be carried out during the rolling process. This is also called normalizing rolling. Not every component needs to be designed for high strength or toughness that can be achieved by normalizing. For example, in the case of a bent component that has only an optical function, it is not important to be able to withstand high loads. Rather, the material is selected for its good formability. If a shoulder is to be milled into the bent component later, good machinability is also important. This plays an essential role, especially in automated production with large batch sizes, in order to make production economical. It may therefore be necessary to modify the microstructure of a steel to make it easier to form or machine. Particularly with regard to formability, it is therefore necessary to create a soft microstructure. This can be achieved by so-called soft annealing. In soft annealing, hypoeutectoid steels are heated to just below the PS line, just before the cementite has converted to austenite. The lamellar cementite now has sufficient time to transform by diffusion processes into the thermodynamically more favorable roundish form. Spherical cementite is then formed from the lamellar cementite of the perlite. This is also known as spheroidal cementite. Once the cementite has been transformed into the round form, the steel is slowly cooled. Unlike hypoeutectoid steels, hyperutectoid steels are heated just above or fluctuating around the SK line during soft annealing. 
A particularly homogeneous microstructure with finely distributed spherical cementite can be achieved by hardening the steel before soft annealing. In this process, the spherical cementite forms from the already relatively homogeneous martensite structure. After soft annealing, the steel shows significantly improved formability due to the spherical shape of the cementite. This is due to facilitated dislocation movement. Whilst the strip-like cementite lamellae sometimes extend completely from one end of the grain to the other, the spherical cementite is only present sporadically in the grain. The dislocation movement is therefore less hindered by the spherical cementite than by the strip cementite. Accordingly, the deformability increases while the hardness decreases. This improves subsequent bending, rolling or deep drawing, as lower forming forces are required. In addition, the spherical cementite improves the machinability of the steel, as the cementite spheres offer less resistance to the cutting edge of the tool than the lamellar cementite form. This increases the tool life before it has to be reground. The image shows a soft annealed steel C45. You can see the spherical cementite that have developed from the strip cementite. So note. The aim of soft annealing is to improve formability and machinability by means of spherical cementite instead of strip cementite in the microstructure. Hypoeutectoid steels with a carbon content of less than about 0.3% are usually not soft annealed as they are relatively soft anyway. Although these steels already have good formability, machinability is poor due to the tendency to smear. The soft material literally sticks to the cutting edge of the tool due to the high temperatures during machining. This results in so-called built-up edges. To give such soft low-carbon steels good machinability, coarse grain annealing as described in the following can be used. While a coarse grain microstructure is generally undesirable due to the lower toughness and strength values, the advantage is the improved machinability due to the increased brittleness of the coarse grain. Coarse grain annealing is an alternative to soft annealing for improving machinability, particularly in the case of the low carbon steels mentioned above with a carbon content of less than 0.3%. In coarse grain annealing, the steel is heated to around 950 to 1100 degrees Celsius. At these high temperatures, diffusion processes can take place to such an extent that atoms can rearrange at the grain boundaries causing them to grow. The driving force for this is ultimately the reduction in surface energy associated with having one large grain instead of many smaller ones. Since diffusion takes time, annealing must be carried out for several hours, depending on the thickness of the workpiece. This makes coarse grain annealing relatively expensive. So note. The aim of coarse grain annealing is to improve the machinability of low carbon steels. Due to the generally unfavorable strength properties, Coarse grain annealing remains restricted to low carbon steels and is very rarely used. After machining, the coarse grain microstructure can be removed by normalizing to achieve better strength values. However, due to the large number of individual process steps, the whole process is relatively expensive. The microstructure of rolled, bent, or deep drawn parts is heavily deformed by the high forces. This also changes the material properties. For example, when a steel sheet is rolled, the round grains are stretched in the rolling direction. Such a stretched microstructure is also called a rolling texture. In a subsequent bending process, the rolled steel sheet behaves differently depending on the bending direction. While the steel tends to crack when bent parallel to the rolling direction, the risk of cracking is much lower when bent transversely to the rolling direction. Formability has therefore become directional due to rolling. This directional dependence of a property is generally referred to as anisotropy. On the other hand, if a material behaves the same in all directions with respect to a particular property, this is called isotropy. Anisotropy in the properties of a material is usually undesirable as it can lead to unpredictable effects. The aim must therefore be to restore the deformed microstructure to its original shape before each multi-stage forming process. This can be achieved by so-called recrystallization annealing. In recrystallization annealing, the steel is heated below the PSK line in the range of 550 to 700 degrees Celsius. This means that there is no lattice transformation, as is the case with normalizing or sometimes with soft annealing, although there is a recrystallization effect in both these processes. In recrystallization annealing, the grain boundaries can migrate due to diffusion processes and the grains reform. The deformed grains return to their original shape and the material regains its isotropic deformation properties. The size of the recrystallized grains depends not only on the annealing time and temperature, but also on the degree of deformation of the individual grains. 
A high degree of deformation with very fine elongated crystals results in a rather fine-grained microstructure. On the other hand, a lower degree of deformation results in a coarser-grained recrystallization structure. However, there is also a risk of coarse grain formation, particularly with a slightly deformed microstructure. This risk can be particularly high in low-carbon steels with carbon contents below 0.2%, so normalizing may be more suitable for recrystallization. On the other hand, for transformation-free steels, where gamma-alpha transformation is completely suppressed by alloying elements, recrystallization annealing is the only way to achieve grain refinement. In order to maintain the formability of the material in multi-stage forming processes, the microstructure must be recrystallized between each forming step. This process is known as intermediate annealing. The effect of recrystallization can also be used during the forming process by forming at the recrystallization temperature. This is called hot forming. If the material is formed below the recrystallization temperature, this is called cold forming. Hot forming places much higher demands on the machines involved, so the economics of hot forming must always be considered. So note. The aim of recrystallization annealing is to restore a deformation-free microstructure to improve formability. During solidification of steels with high alloy concentrations, an uneven distribution of the alloying elements in the microstructure can occur. Such differences in concentration within individual crystals are also known as crystal segregation or microsegregation. The different alloy concentrations are also associated with different properties within a grain. It may therefore be necessary to eliminate the concentration differences within a microstructure by a process known as diffusion annealing. In diffusion annealing, the steel is heated to relatively high temperatures between 1050 and 1300 degrees Celsius. This ensures that the diffusion processes can take place at a sufficient rate for the atoms to cover long distances. Nevertheless, several hours of annealing are usually required. As microsegregations occur during the solidification of the steel, they are usually removed directly from the cast ingot at the steelworks. However, this process is very demanding and energy-intensive due to the high temperatures and long annealing times. A disadvantage of diffusion annealing is the coarse grain formation caused by the high temperatures. Although this could be reduced by lowering the temperature, longer annealing times would then be required and diffusion annealing would no longer be economical. If the formation of coarse grains cannot be prevented during diffusion annealing, the coarse grain microstructure must be removed afterwards. This can be achieved by subsequent normalizing. So note, the aim of diffusion annealing is to equalize concentration differences. During welding or hot forming, microstructural changes occur in the steel due to the effects of heat and uncontrolled cooling. This is particularly the case with austenitic steels, where carbide precipitation can occur at grain boundaries due to the high temperatures in the range of 500 to 800 degrees Celsius. The steel is also subject to corrosion due to the different electrochemical properties. The different electrochemical properties lead to intergranular corrosion. To prevent this, the precipitates formed must be dissolved. This can be achieved by solution annealing in the range of approximately 1000 to 1100 degrees Celsius. In the case of a deformed microstructure, the effect of recrystallization also occurs. Solution annealing is also used as an intermediate step in the value chain to temporarily improve machinability. Annealing dissolves the precipitates responsible for the poor machinability. If the workpiece is then rapidly cooled, a supersaturated metastable solid solution microstructure develops without precipitates. In this state, the machinability of the material is temporarily improved. The subsequent aging process causes the precipitates to form and the material regains its original properties. This process is used, for example, in the precipitation hardening of aluminium alloys. So note, the aim of solution annealing is to dissolve formed precipitates. When a steel is heated or cooled unevenly stresses, also known as residual stresses, can occur. Residual stresses often occur during welding, for example, because the workpiece is heated only at certain points and then cools in an uncontrolled manner. Residual stresses can also occur in the workpiece during milling or turning because high temperatures can occur in the machining zone of the workpiece. Such residual stresses can reduce the strength of the component. In addition, residual stresses can cause distortion of the component during subsequent machining if the residual stresses are released abruptly. During hardening, quench distortion is also due to residual stresses created by uneven cooling. Therefore, in some cases, 
it is necessary to eliminate the residual stresses that have developed in the workpiece. This is done by stress relief annealing. Stress relief annealing involves heating the workpiece below the PSK line in the range of 550 to 650 degrees Celsius. The effect of stress relief is based on the fact that the strength of the heated component decreases with increasing temperature. When the yield strength, or more precisely the hot yield strength, falls below the value of the residual stresses, the dislocations begin to migrate and the residual stresses are relieved by plastic deformation. Residual stresses can therefore only be relieved up to the hot yield point, never completely. After annealing, the workpiece must be cooled slowly to prevent stresses from reappearing. Usually, the workpiece is cooled slowly in the switched-off annealing furnace. So note, the aim of stress relief annealing is to release residual stresses. Finally, the most important annealing processes and their objectives are briefly summarized. The goal of improved formability can be achieved, for example, by soft annealing. This also improves machinability. In these cases, however, coarse grain annealing is usually carried out on low carbon steels. The setting of a certain grain size can be achieved not only by coarse grain annealing, but also by normalizing or recrystallization annealing. In the latter two annealing processes, the focus is usually on achieving a fine-grained and homogeneous microstructure. Diffusion or solution annealing is used to homogenize the alloying elements in case of uneven distribution of the alloying elements or to remove precipitates. When the aim is to reduce residual stresses due to uneven heating or cooling, stress relief annealing is used. On the other hand, if a certain strength is required, normalizing is used for higher strength or soft annealing for lower strength and better formability. Strength can also be controlled by a special heat treatment called quenching and tempering. Hardness can also be controlled by hardening as a further heat treatment. Whereas the driving force for the microstructural change in the above-mentioned annealing processes is always the achievement of a lower energy state, which means the pursuit of thermodynamic equilibrium, quenching and tempering deliberately induces a thermodynamic state of disequilibrium in the microstructure. Thermodynamic equilibrium is deliberately prevented by rapid cooling. Because of these fundamental differences, hardening and tempering are usually listed separately from annealing. Due to the complexity of hardening and tempering, we will go into more detail in a separate video.